good. It should be illegal to make a, a video that beautiful, but right before I have to preach. Anyway, it's been said so well already. Happy Mother's Day, okay? Now, and any time that um, I get to spend time with you on here, I always like to take a moment to acknowledge those um, who don't feel like today's real happy. Maybe your mother is in heaven, and so you're celebrating without her. Maybe you've got a baby or babies in heaven, and you're celebrating without them. But know that God sees you, and he loves you, and I'm done crying, Okay? <laughs> My name is Pastor Nikki Garcia, and I really am happy to be with you guys today. So before we get into the word, let me pray with you guys, and then we'll get right in. Father, I thank you for all that you're doing here at the Family Church, Mother's Day aside. Holy Spirit, just that you're moving in our congregation. Lord, what that looks like is that people are hungry for you. Their faith is bold and rising up to that which you've called them. God, now I do pray for the moms in this room those who are celebrating today and it's a good thing and then those who are celebrating today and it's not as happy as it once was. Father, I thank you that your grace meets them where they're at and carries them forward. In Jesus' name, everybody said real loud. Amen. 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 Well, Mother's Day is one of my absolute favorite days to be with you guys because I love highlighting different moms from scripture. Here's what I know. The Lord did not bypass moms when he wrote the story of Jesus Christ. On the contrary, all throughout scripture, there are mothers who gave their yes to God and through their obedience came the story of the Bible. In fact, Jesus Christ's very own mother had to say yes to God in a radical way when she found out just when she was about 14 or 15 is what um, theologians tell us, when she said yes to carrying the call as the mother of Jesus born a virgin, right? To say, yes, God, be it unto me as you have spoken. So I just, I love mothers, not because I am one, but because they're so special to God's heart. Guys, don't worry. I love Father's Day too, but you get your moment next month, okay? We love the dads in this house. Now, Mother's Day is really unique because, like I said, there is a slew of different moms from the Bible that um, we have as options to learn from. And truly, sometimes I, I do go back and forth Um, between different options as I put a message together because I want to make sure it's applicable to everybody in the house, not just moms. So although we are going to highlight a couple of moms today, I do want you to know that these principles apply to anyone in this place who have accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior, who have influence over young minds, young hearts, whether you're an aunt or an uncle, brother or sister, whatever. These principles apply, okay? Are we happy to be in church today? Yes? Good. Good. Well, before I tell you who I want to talk about, I wanted to, I wanted to give you 
One principle to start off with, okay? The principle is this. The most important place that your children learn about Christianity is not in the four walls of a church. It's not from a pastor on stage. It's not from a minister or a youth leader or a nursery teacher or a kid's pastor. It's actually from the, the way that you live your life for Christ in your home. I think that the Lord did this on purpose, okay? The reason is because when you say yes to Jesus, you're not saying yes to doing Jesus things just when you're in a church. It should impact the entirety of your life, right? And for many of you guys, you've walked through transformations like incredibly where it's only the power of God that can take you from point A to point B in your transformational walk with Christ. Many of you guys know that it's not just meant to be displayed on social media or at your workplace or wherever in public, but actually the primary way that you should display your walk with Christ is in the home. Amen? Now, this is really good news for people who feel like you've got a good uh, display of faith in your life, but this can be hard for people who are still trying to figure it out and get it together. I want to tell you something. I know I just said that the primary way that your family learns how to be a Christian is in the home. I also want to tell you that you, mom, dad, you are anointed and appointed to be the example of Christ that your kid needs so that they can fulfill their destiny in Jesus. Know that, okay? Someone's happy about that. I am too. <laughs> I wanted to point this out in scripture that this is actually God's design before we uh, move on in our message. But early on in the Old Testament, there was a group of people called the Israelites. And these were God's chosen people. The reason is because it would be from the Israelites that Jesus would be born. Okay, so the Old Testament narrative is all surrounding the Israelites, their walk with God, their journey in the faith. And then eventually to the, um, the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It came from these people. The, the Israelites get a lot of airtime in scripture. Moses, who wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, his responsibility was to hear from God and then share to the people what God spoke. How many of you guys are familiar with the Ten Commandments? Ten Commandments, lots of hand raised. That came from God's mouth, was given to Moses. It was Moses' responsibility to give it to the people and then see that the people followed through with living their life according to the Ten Commandments. Um, we don't live in the Old Testament anymore, so I'm not trying to put the Ten Commandments on you. But the point is, something that was incredibly important for the Israelite people was given to Moses. Moses had to give it to the people and make sure that they lived it out. That we see God choose his method, and it wasn't a church. It's, this is incredible, because in Deuteronomy 6, we're going to put that on the screen here. This is Moses telling the people, he says, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. The Ten Commandments. Commit yourselves wholeheartedly. He says, repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your heart and on your gates. And I love that when Moses was telling the people to commit themselves wholeheartedly to their walk with Christ, he didn't mention a church. Contradictory, because we're in church today, please keep coming to church. Yeah. But remember I said, the primary way that your children learn about God and live out their Christian faith is in the four walls of your home, mom and dad. This is also the primary place that you walk out your relationship with God. We just did a series, Pastor John did, on wedded wisdom. He was talking about marriage and all of the amazing things that come with it. He gave us a lot of wisdom. But I love in, in the book of Ephesians, it says that the man and the woman are supposed to be a reflection of Christ in the church. And so the, the, the children in the home would then be the reflection of the members of a church, where they watch the example of Christ in the church within their home. It's beautiful. Now, I think that this communicates the weight that we carry as Christian men and women who are raising up families because it's so easy for you guys to drop your kiddos off in our babies and toddlers ministry. Thank God for them, right? It's a good thing that you do. But if we're not careful, sometimes we leave it to the people who are on staff at the church, babies and toddlers, kids ministry, youth ministry, pastors up here, young adults ministry, groups, wherever, to be the ones to be the primary disciples of our kids. And that's just simply not the way that God created it to be. We are here to equip you to then appoint, so you can be anointed to be in the home and be the impact, the main impact 
for Christ in your children's lives. There's a, again, um, like I said, I had a lot of options on who to preach from today or who to preach about today. And this woman is actually one that I said I wasn't going to preach about again. I'm going to out myself. I preached on her last year, but for something very different. And I said something similar to like, I learned about this woman early on in my walk with Christ, probably 14 years ago. And I was just trying to find out what does it mean to be a godly woman, right? What, what does that mean? And so Google, Hobby Lobby, uh, Christian t-shirts, other Christian mugs, they had a lot to say about a woman who was strong, virtuous, wise, like a real estate agent. She bought and sold fields because it was profitable. A chef, she created all her own food. Um, this woman, what else? She s rose really early in the morning to get to work, and it says that her family did not eat the, the product of idleness. That's a fancy word to say this chick was always busy. She got up before the sun was up. She went down after it was down, so she was also probably really tired. But then there's a scripture that get a lot of real estate, like I said, in Hobby Lobby decor and on Christian mugs that says she laughs without fear of the future, right? Her family, her, her husband and her kids, they rise up and they praise her for she is virtuous and she just did all the right things in her home. Who do you guys think I'm talking about today? Wow, Christian knows. Who else? Who are we talking about today? The Proverbs 31 woman. And, and maybe you don't know about her, and that's okay too. Then this will be new information for you. But this is a woman that, that, like I said, she probably is spoken about more at women's conferences and on Mother's Day and all of the, the great ways. But early on in my walk with Christ, I kind of wrote her off to just be an unrealistic example of what I'll never be. I'm happy for her and for her family, but look, my family, I don't get up before the sun rises. I get up to the sound of their cries, right? So it's just, it, it, there were a lot of ways that I couldn't identify with her. I couldn't relate to her. But I gave her a fair shot. She's beautiful. Like I said, I love that life for her, but a lot of her life would not be mine. There was one uncommon trait, though, that over the years I've just kind of glossed over and genuinely chalked it out to be something that she did that was outdated and not applicable to me or to the life of any modern-day mom, woman, wife, whatever. This really unique trait is going to be the highlight of what we talk about today. The Proverbs 31 woman, like I said, strong, virtuous, smart, entrepreneur, I mean, you name it. Proverbs 31, verse 19, after it talks about all of the good thing that she does, it says, she puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold a spindle. I understand when it says that she laughs without fear of the future, that she's got a confident faith. I understand the entrepreneurial spirit. I understand working in her home, but I could not understand what the significance of a distaff and a spindle was. But how many, how many of you know the word is alive and active? Come on, right? Sharper than any two-edged sword. It also says that the word is profitable for learning life and godliness. And what's in scripture is not by accident. So every word in scripture can be applied to the Christian life. I didn't know how to apply a distaff and a spindle. I didn't even know what it was. So I took to Google because any other, uh, like anyone else in this room, when you don't know what something is, Google does, right? So I Googled, what is a distaff and a spindle? And then this picture came up. A distaff and a spindle. A spindle is what she has in her right hand, and a distaff is what she has in her left hand. Now, this was something scripture says that she grasped. She had to use both hands in order to make this happen. But what she was actually doing was she was um, manipulating raw material to eventually make a garment. Clothing, it could be a bedspread, scripture says. It could be a linen tablecloth. It could be clothing for herself. And she actually, in her entrepreneurial spirit, she sold clothing, very well-made clothing, and she made a profit for it. So this woman knew exactly what it meant to use a distaff and a spindle. In fact, I found out that there were three different ways that women of old would create these garments. And this was one of the three ways. It is actually the only one of the three ways that ceases to exist today. People just don't use a distaff and a spindle anymore. For many reasons, I think because we have Target, thank you, Captain Jack, right? But I also think it's because the distaff and the spindle would you had to manipulate the material in such a way, again, you would go from raw material to then spun material to then sewing to make a garment. It, it required your hands not only to be full, but the delicate skin on your hands would begin to blister. It would begin to be made raw. It was something that would affect you for a long time after because how many of you guys know that when you've got blisters on your hands, it's really hard to go about your daily life. But this woman knew 
that the distaff in a spindle was the way that was her, cho her chosen method in order to get her family clothed and covered the way that they needed to be. Now again, I was reading this and I was like, yeah, good, I don't need to know about this. I'll never have to apply this to my life. But then I kept reading about the Proverbs 31 woman. I found that in about the 20 verses where this woman is described, four or five of them talk about clothing. Clothing was really important to her, and not just in a superficial way, but it's because it would be the very thing that reflected the household. It would reflect her. It was something important for her. They're going to pull up the different ways that clothing is mentioned. But she sought out the wool. She sought out the material. She would put it on the spindle and the distaff. She would then make it not only for her household, but for the public to be sold. This chick's a beast. And I, I don't know anyone who lives up to her caliber, but I'm really glad that she did that. Now... I don't think in church today you're going to learn about how to spin raw material and make it into a garment for your family. But I know that something that the Proverbs 31 knew was that the clothing that her children wore mattered, and she was a seamstress. Huge. She was actually, I think that she was a sought-after seamstress for the uh, sheer fact that she would sell the clothing. But here's the thing. You will probably never make the clothing that your children wear on their body. Unless you do, unless you're a seamstress, then, I mean, that's awesome. You have a skill that not a lot of people do. Like I said, you may never use a distaff in a spindle, but in the same way that this woman knew that the, ch the clothing her children wore mattered and she's a seamstress, moms especially, and also dads, I'm going to tell you, this carries over in a supernatural and a spiritual sense. The clothing that your children wear matter, and you are the seamstress. Here, here's what I know. Moms, how many of you guys know that we care a lot about clothes? In fact, there are some moms who you'll go out all tirada with your hair in a bun. That's me. You just put your sunglasses on. You'll wear leggings and a big t-shirt, but your kid has to be well-dressed because that's your, that's your kid, right? You're not about to send them out all crazy looking, but you can look like whatever you want. Clothing matters. I remember early on when, um, right before I had, or right after I had my first daughter, Emberly, my only daughter, Emberly, when it was cold outside, I knew that my mother, if my mother-in-law was going to come and see her, Ricky and I grew up in very different households, okay? Uh, he is Hispanic, I'm not. So socks in the cold wasn't like a requirement. I would actually go out with like sandals on and my hair wet, but as soon as I would see my swag guy, I was like, Nikia, you have to put a hood over your head and what are you doing in sandals? So you can only imagine <laughs> when my daughter came along and my mother-in-law was walking to her house, I'd see her and I'd tell Ricky, babe, hurry up, go get the socks. You have to put the socks on Emberly because my swag guy's coming. <laughs> He knows, I'm not lying, it's true. She trained me well, I get the socks on my kids now. But my mother-in-law knew something about clothing that I learned too. It's our responsibility to clothe our kids for the elements. The Proverbs 31 woman. The reason that this is so important to her is found in a scripture that I haven't read to you yet, but I want to now. Verse 21 says this. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all of her household are clothed in scarlet. I'm going to read that again. She's not afraid of snow for her household. For all her household are clothed in scarlet. Remember I said she was the seamstress of her household? It's because of this right here. Where, where the Proverbs 31 woman lived, it didn't get very cold very often. And, it, and in fact, it didn't snow very often at all. But the thing is, sometimes it did. It's not like the valley where we get snow once every 50 years. It was common. You had to have snow clothing on hand for when the elements did come because they didn't have modern day heating. Um, they couldn't just whip up a fire really quick. If the snow came and she wasn't prepared, then it would affect her family. The scarlet, this is beautiful. The scarlet that she wove was actually made with her distaff and spindle. And if you look into the significance of scarlet, it not only was a dyed material, but the, the original language here is implying that it's a layered material. This means that this woman spun the scarlet and made the scarlet, and she didn't do it flippantly. She got her hands in it because she knew that when the elements came to her family, it's her responsibility to clothe them. Do you know that it's the same way for you and me today? What our children wear matter. The clothes our children are matter, and we are the seamstress. There are two ways that we do this, okay? But before I move on, I want to tell you something. Something that I felt, um, I shared this with the last service, but as I was getting ready to, to preach this, I, f I got this sense that there are parents in the room who maybe didn't understand the weight and the responsibility that you carry to clothe your children. Let me tell you something. 
If you don't clothe them for the elements, do you know that the world will? Do you know that the scarlet material that her children wore, it's because she knew that there would be a threat coming by the elements and her kids needed to be covered? I want to tell you, in the same way, when you send your kids out every single day for school, they will come back. And the, the trouble could be that they're clothed in something that you didn't put them in when you sent them off. Right? When Emberly was three years old, she was in a K-3 class at her school. And of course, they have uniforms, but I mean, three and four-year-olds, they're just messy and dirty, so they need to be changed a lot. And it, it wasn't uncommon for us to pick up Emberly or to get her dropped off to her house to see her in clothes that I didn't put on her. And it's a random, like, blue shoe, and she's a girl. My, girls can wear blue, don't get me wrong. But she would come in with a shirt that, like, didn't fit her, and it had stains, too. It wasn't what I put her in. And it's my responsibility as a parent. Come on. When our kids come home and we see something that the world put on them that we didn't clothe them in, to see it, to call it out, and to take it off of them. Wow. What we clothe our kids in matter. And I'm going to pause here because there are two things that I want to talk about. Okay? I'm going to pause here. Some, some parents may feel like a disconnect to your children. You might, that might make you discouraged in doing what I'm about to preach about. And I, I didn't sense this in the 10 a.m., but I do now. Some of the disconnect may come from how disengaged you might feel in your, parent, in your child's life. I don't know if you feel disqualified. I don't know if maybe you feel discredited. I don't know, and this is, okay, I feel like it could be this. You feel like you don't have the room to speak to them about the things of God because it's not the way that you live. You don't want to be called a hypocrite because you know that if you're holding them to something, you need to be the example, right? I, I, I wonder, though, I wonder if today's not the day that you decide to get engaged in the things of God so that it can be, your home can be the way that you're, the primary place that your kids are discipled in. I wonder if it's, if, if it's not timely for you to say, before I try to make clothing for my kids, I know I gotta dress myself up in the things of God. I can be an example. I can speak in authority. When the world, when I see things that the world's put on them, I have the spiritual equity and territory to say, not in my house. For me, in my house, we will serve the Lord. In Jesus' name. That's really important to me because I do feel a little bit more of a disconnect in this service. And it's not a bad thing. Not necessarily. I just know that I need to slow it down. And I think, I, I believe that what the scripture says about this woman, before we move on, it says that she herself was clothed in purple and linen. She got herself dressed before she could get her kids dressed. She was engaged in the things that she was trying to put her kids in. And so in her responsibility, in the way that we clothe our kids, we do that one of two ways. The first way is we clothe them for the elements. We talked about this a little bit already, and I want to share a scripture with you. The reason that, that grass spinning with the um, spindle and distaff, the reason that it ceases to exist today is because it was very costly. Not just in, in terms of the investment like in the material, but it was costly in time, energy, effort, the condition of your hands. Like I said, it took a lot for the woman to be able to spin it this way. I feel the same about the way that we clothe our children for the elements. The way that we do this is by way of prayer. All throughout scripture, we see women who were on their knees praying for their kids, seeing it was like, it's, it's almost like they birthed the child physically, but the call of the child was birthed also in them spiritually through prayer, right? How many of you guys know that the Lord will show you things about your kid before they're ever even born? And even when they're born, two years old, all dirty and grimy and gross, they've got a call on their life and it's birthed first in your prayer life. Amen. So how is it then, moms and dads, that we clothe our kids for the elements? This is through prayer. James 5.16, I want to read it to you. It says this. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful adults. Uh, adults, nope. Produces wonderful results. I think it, prayer produces wonderful adults too, you know. But Proverbs 31 then says this, and I want to connect the two. She seeks wool and flax, and she works with willing hands. 
The reason that this, this word willing hands mattered was because it's very possible to mother in an unwilling way. Right? Can we be real? When it sometimes feels like an obligation rather than an honor? When our responsibilities sometimes feel more burdensome than they do joyous? I feel like for parents in the room, those who feel disconnected to your kids, those who feel like you've stepped out of the limelight in their spiritual walk, it's time to have willing hands in their life again. Amen? Now, moving forward with this, this is important to say. The reason that this is huge, and I, I want to tell you a personal example in my own life, is because, like I said, when the elements meet your child, it's very possible that you'll, they'll walk into the house wearing something you didn't put on them. Here's why living this way in the home is critical. Like I said, my daughter, she, she goes to a Christian school. She also attends this church, and she's here just as much as I am, which is a lot, right? Because I work here. She doesn't, but she comes with me. And one time I was sitting with her on my couch, and she was, um, I think she was four years old, so this was close to two years ago, something like that. And of course, she's really young, but, but she's been raised in church for her four years, and she would sing little praise and worship song, and she could recite small words from scripture. So I said, Emberly, what's your favorite verse from the Bible? Probably not the best thing to ask your four-year-old. I don't know. Maybe yours is more spiritual than mine, and she'll tell you, but my four-year-old didn't tell me. But what she did say was, her response was, Bible? That's a school word. And in my head, I'm like, what do you mean? You don't hear that at church? I know she does, but it's just the way that her mind was processing. But beyond that, it was almost like a, a, a punch to my gut. Where I'm like, the Bible shouldn't be a school word to her. It should be a word that she hears more at her home than she does in her school. That alone showed me. It kind of set off sirens in me. And I'll speak for myself, not for anybody else. I knew that it was time that I don't let the scripture, the Bible, the things of God be learned on her part outside of my home. It needed to be displayed in my home. The Bible will be a word that they use at home. The love of God will be something that's spoken at home. Amen? In the place of prayer, where you speak out the things that your kids will be met with when they face the elements, Moms and dads, your words matter. Okay, this scripture, it's not going to be pulled up, but it says, life and death are in the power of your tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. This means that you pray over them what the Holy Spirit has showed you, because this goes hand in hand with the second way that you clothe them. This is my favorite part, actually. The second, I love praying for my kids, but the second way that you clothe them is they'll be clothed in purpose, and this speaks about their identity. Now, at this point in the message, I'm going to let the Proverbs 31 woman kind of hand the baton to another woman in the Bible, and her name is Hannah. If you guys aren't familiar with Hannah, then she is uh, someone in the Old Testament, but this mom, I love her story. She's talked about very often. She actually battled infertility, and the scripture talks about it. If you couldn't have a baby in the Old Testament, this almost spoke to your, not almost, it did, speak to your value as a woman, and it's almost like you were worth less, which is so twisted and backwards and, and not God's heart for women, but it was the societal norm of the day. And so this woman, Hannah, was married to a man named Elkanah, and Elkanah had a sister wife. Now that part don't apply to your life. That is a scripture. We will learn the lesson from it. This is not giving you permission to have a second wife, man. I don't think you can handle a second wife anyway, okay? But Hannah was the wife of a man named Elkanah, and, and she could not have kids, but her sister wife did. She was like popping out kids like hotcakes. Scripture says that Hannah battled infertility for, for such a long length of time that she could see other people, her sister wife, having multiple children. And if you've ever struggled through any part of infertility, you know how painful that can be, right? It's painful. But this woman, Hannah, she knew she was born to be a mom. And so what she did was she took this experience to prayer. She got on her knees and she said, God, I will. I want to be a mom. Give me a son. And God, I will dedicate the son that you give me back to you. This son will live his life for you. She saw who this son would be in her prayer life before he was ever even born from her body. That's beautiful. That's what it means to pray for your child, right? To see who they'll be before they ever come to this earth. But that's not the part of the story that I want to talk about for the rest of the time we have together. The rest of the story is what she did when this man Samuel, her son Samuel, was born. 
She was good to her word. Again, she told God, if you give me a son, I will dedicate him back to you. And this went beyond sometimes what we do today. We stand up here for a child dedication, which is good. Keep doing that. But this woman put her, work, her money where her mouth was. In fact, scripture says that the baby was born. She was nursing him. But when it came time for him to be weaned, he stopped nursing from her body. Then he could be pretty much on his own and, and to be raised in the hands of somebody that wasn't Hannah. And so scripture says that Hannah goes and she drops him off with a priest named Eli. And he would be raised in the temple. He would be almost mentored to become a priest because she was good to her word. She said, Lord, this baby will serve you all the days of her life. And it came time to put her action where her faith was. She gave Samuel to the priest Eli. He was raised in the temple, but Hannah didn't stop mothering him there. She not only prayed for him, she not only clothed him for the elements, so to speak, but she clothed him for his purpose, what he would walk in, his identity. Scripture says this. This is after she's dropped him off. It says, Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy with a linen ephod. Basically, all you need to know there is an ephod was like a garment, something that was draped over him. So he was just a little guy. And he had a linen ephod, which is something that grown men would wear. So it was a tiny linen ephod, and this little boy wore it as he was being trained, as he ministered before the Lord. And then it says, and his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she, went up and her hus when she and her husband went up to offer the yearly sacrifice. She clothed her child for purpose. She spoke I the identity over him that the Lord had birthed on the inside of her. But what that looks like for you and me is different because I guarantee you, you're not in here giving your child to a priest to be raised in the temple. I know that's not the case for you. But you are in here where you receive your child when they're wearing the things that the world put on them, when they're sitting in front of you and they're acting completely opposite of what you know they're called to be. The way that you clothe them with identity and clothe them with purpose is to speak out not what they're not doing, but who, what they are to do. You will be blessed in Jesus' name. You will be saved in Jesus' name. You will fulfill the number of the days that's set before you in Jesus' name. You will live in God's will in Jesus' name. And it's this cycle of rinse and repeat where you have to remove the clothing that the world's put on them and put on their spiritual identity. It's absolutely critical. Now, what you choose to do in a message like this means everything. Listen, if you feel like I will leave it to the church people and I will just excuse myself at the door right now, can I charge you? Don't disqualify yourself. This, this um, service feels very different than the 10 a.m. And not that it's all about feeling. But I believe that instead of thinking about where you need to clothe your child, I want you to take that away and I want you to do homework with it. But what I want to do for the rest of the time here is talk about how to clothe yourself. I'm going to find the scripture in Proverbs 31. Well, no, let me not do that. I'll just, I'll say it verbally. It says that before she could clothe other people, the Proverbs 31 woman clothed herself in linen. Clothed herself in purple linen. What that spoke of was royalty. I want to take time right now for you to clothe yourself in who the king of kings tells you that you are who the creator of the universe tells you that you are, come on, who the Lord of Lords says that you are. Before you can speak identity over your child, you have to know what God says over you. I know that to be the case. I know that to be true. Let me give you an example before we get into prayer. Emberly, this happened just last week. We had to talk to her, I, I, I did, I think my husband did too, but she was starting to ask questions and say things like, mommy, marry, girls can marry other girls. And she wasn't asking, she was telling me, girls can marry other girls. Like she had been told that somewhere. Keep in mind, she spends the majority of her time in, a, in the context of a Christian world. The school that she goes to, Christian. The home that she's raised in, she lives with a pastor, Christian. Ricky and I do our best to display the things of Christ. She's in a Christian church, but let me tell you, the world is still going to try to put on a different identity over your kids, no matter what. And so I sat with her, but I had to know what the word of God said before I could speak it to her. I had to be so committed to the truth that I know to be in scripture in order to 
teach her and to disciple her and to pray for her and to, and to tell her what it was. I had to know my own identity. Would you guys bow your heads with me? I want to do something. I want to do something. Hmm. If you're in this place and you've been listening to this message and there's like a pull on the inside of you to put this into practice in your own home, but you know that before you can clothe your kids for the elements in prayer, before you can clothe your kids for purpose and speaking their identity, you have to take off the worldly identity that you might live in and put on the robe of righteousness that, that God's cut out for you. This comes to having a relationship with Jesus before you can do any of that. And the, altar, the, the music can be turned on. But listen, if you're in this place and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you've not made him your Lord and Savior, maybe you're here and you're saying, I really want my household to be the place where people, where my kids learn about Jesus, but I need help. I need to make him my Lord and Savior. You know, Scripture says that in moments like these, if you make the decision in your heart to accept Jesus as Lord, that when you die, you'll spend eternity in heaven, but for the rest of this world, the Holy Spirit will come in and he'll give you power. He'll help you. He'll teach you who you are so that you can teach your kids who they are. If you've never given your life to Christ and you want to do that today, you want a relationship with the Lord, would you raise your hand where I can see it? Would you raise your hand real high where I can see it? A couple of hands. Oh, a good amount of hands. Keep your hands up. Maybe you're in this place and at one time you did give your life to Christ, but you know that you've gotten off course and you want to rededicate your life to him, not just for your kids, but for yourself, because you know you're walking in an identity that doesn't belong to you. You want to rededicate your life to Christ. Would you put your hand up where I can see it? I know there's more. I see the hands. Thank you, Jesus. I want to do something right now. You guys can put your hands down. I don't want anybody praying alone, church. So would you guys pray with me? as these people who just had their hand raised make a decision in their heart by faith that a miracle would happen, that the Holy Spirit would move into their heart so that they can, he can live there for the rest of this life. They go on a journey of finding out who they are in Christ, changing the course of their history, of their, of their destiny, and also impacting generations to come. Would you guys repeat after me? Say, Father God, I thank you for Jesus, that he died for me. Holy Spirit, Come into my heart. Save me right now. I thank you that because of my confession, my decision of faith, that you live in me, that heaven is my eternal home, that I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We can give them a round of applause. Before you guys get up, I'm not done. We're going to do one more thing, and it'll be quick, I promise. Photo booths can wait. Everything in the lobbies can wait, I promise you. This is important. If you are committing to clothing your children for the elements through prayer and clothing your children in their purpose through their identity, would you put your hands up where I can see it? Would you put your hands up if you're saying yes to this charge? This challenge is yours. You're anointed. You're appointed. I want to pray for you, and you guys can, can close your eyes. Father, you see the hearts of those who have their hands raised today. I thank you that people walk away with this message with hope, with some direction. Holy Spirit, your word says that you guide us and lead us into all direction, that you're our helper, that you are our healer. Father, for people who feel like their children have veered off course, I speak a supernatural stopping point in the name of Jesus. Lord, our children in here will declare that you are Lord, and I thank you that everything that you've called them to do, that they'll do in Jesus' name. Thank you for the privilege, God, the honor that it is to take responsibility, to take the authority for the, the territory that we have in our home, to say, me and my house will serve the Lord. Holy Spirit, bless these parents as they go. I thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said real loud, amen. 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 Thank you, guys.